students, both those who are taking this class from me in real life, and you guys out in the internet world. Thanks for watching this, my third video on nuclear chemistry. In today's video, I'm going to teach you guys what makes something uh, from a nuclear standpoint unstable, including radioactive. You might begin by asking, what do you mean unstable? As it turns out, whether an element is radioactive or not is determined by its nuclear stability, which is directly related to its ratio of protons to neutrons. Generally speaking, all elements with atomic numbers of 20 or below must have a roughly 1 to 1 ratio of protons to neutrons to be stable. All elements with atomic numbers larger than 20 have to have a gradually increasing but greater than 1 neutron to proton ratio relative to their atomic numbers to be stable. This is illustrated in the figure shown here called the belt of stability. As you can see, all elements with numbers larger than bismuth 209, which is way up here, are radioactive. In summary, any dot that's yellow represents an element that's unstable from a nuclear standpoint. Generally speaking, if you're above this belt of stability, these blue dots, these are isotopes that will have a preferred mode of decay be beta emission. As you get nuclei that have atomic numbers above 84, the dominant decay mode is alpha emission because they want to decrease their number of neutrons relative to protons. And elements shown down here below the belt of stability have a preferred decay mode of positron emission or electron capture. We'll now continue by reading three bullet points from page 880 of our text. Referring to our figure that shows the nuclear belt of stability, Nuclei above the belt of stability have a high neutron to proton ratio. These neutron rich nuclei can lower their ratio and thereby move toward the belt of stability by emitting a beta particle because beta emission decreases the number of neutrons and increases the number of protons. Second are nuclei below the belt of stability which have a low neutron to proton ratio. These proton rich nuclei can increase their ratio and so move closer to the belt of stability by either positron emission or electron capture because both decays increase the number of neutrons and decrease the number of protons. Positron emission is more common among lighter nuclei. Electron capture becomes increasingly common as the nuclear charge increases. The third category are nuclei with atomic numbers greater than or equal to 84. These heavy nuclei tend to undergo alpha emission, which decreases both the number of neutrons and the number of protons by two, moving the nucleus diagonally toward the belt of stability. Okay then. Now, a nucleus can also change its identity if it's struck by a neutron or by another nucleus. This process is called nuclear transmutation, which was first discovered in 1919 by Ernest Rutherford, who performed this reaction, where he bombarded nitrogen-14 atoms with helium-4, or alpha particles, and transformed some of those into oxygen-17 and hydrogen-1 atoms. Nuclear transmutations have allowed scientists to synthesize hundreds of useful isotopes in the lab. One of these is cobalt-60, which is made through a series of transmutation reactions shown on page 885 of our text. Cobalt-60, just so you know, is used in cancer radiation therapy. Now, nuclear transmutations can be done with heavier atoms from the periodic table to form new, previously unknown elements. This is accomplished by using something called a particle accelerator, also called an atom smasher cyclotron or synchrotron. One particle accelerator called the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, or RHIC, at Brookhaven National Lab on Long Island, New York, is shown on the next slide. Now, as mentioned before, these particle accelerators can be used to create previously unobserved elements, which is a continuing focus of cutting-edge research. In fact, the edition of our book that I used when I was an undergraduate which happened to be the 8th edition, only had 109 elements on its periodic table. Our current edition, which is the 12th edition, has 112, with six more having been reportedly discovered, but still not named. Here, for your reference, is a picture of the RHIC. If you'd like, you could pause the video here and read each of the stages of particle acceleration as this figure summarizes. One thing you'll notice looking at this figure is that the actual size of the loop used here in the particle acceleration is very, very large. This one has a circumference of 3.8 kilometers, and there is at least one other particle accelerator that's even larger that I'll talk about momentarily. This huge size is required in order to get those uh, elements to be sped up at a fast enough speed. They're almost approaching the speed of light so that when they collide into each other, they can be transformed into other elements. 
contemplating this, it makes me laugh hilariously when I see that scene from the movie Iron Man 2 in which Iron Man creates a new element by setting up a mini particle accelerator in his basement. Absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, as promised, I want to talk about another very famous particle accelerator called the Hadron Collider. The Hadron Collider, often called the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, is located at CERN, which is the Conseil Européen pour la Recherche Nucléaire. De... Yeah, I think that's uh, maybe French or something. I can't really pronounce it because I don't speak that language. Anyway, it's a facility located in Geneva, Switzerland. This particle accelerator, just so you know, was featured in Dan Brown's book, Angels and Demons, the prequel to The Da Vinci Code. Now, both of these books were made into movies by Ron Howard, and this is a movie poster of that one. Now, the LHC happens to be the particle accelerator that was used to confirm the existence of a previously theoretical particle called the Higgs boson, colloquially referred to as the God particle. This discovery was made on March 14th of 2013. You can read more about it at the Wikipedia entry on the Higgs boson, whose HTML link is shown here. Cool? Cool. Okay. Now, just so you know, some radioactive elements undergo radioactive decay very slowly, while others do so very quickly. This principle is used in radiometric dating, often with carbon-14 or C-14, which I'll now explain. Cosmic radiation in the upper atmosphere catalyzes the combining of C-14 and oxygen to form C-14 containing carbon dioxide, shown here with this symbol, which eventually makes its way down into the lower atmosphere and into plants during their photosynthesis. So a very small amount of the CO2 taken in by plants is C14O2. Now this process ensures that plants have a roughly constant ratio of C14 relative to C12 in them, C12 being the more common isotope of carbon in the biosphere. Now when animals eat plants, or if they eat other animals that have eaten plants, they also incorporate the C14 into their bodies and consequently maintain roughly the same relative C14 to C12 ratio. So when animals die, they stop eating plants. Probably should come as no surprise. Thus, they stop maintaining their previously constant C14 to C12 ratio. Their carbon-14 then gradually decays according to this reaction. You'll see that carbon-14 is decaying to yield an electron or beta particle and be transformed into nitrogen-14. Now carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,715 years. Parenthetically, I should mention that I confess that I have no idea how this number was obtained. I don't know if anyone actually sat down and with a stopwatch and measured it, but you know, that's the number. Thus, measuring how much carbon-14 is left in an ancient organism once it's unearthed can allow us to reasonably calculate how long ago it died. Carbon-14 dating cannot be used to date objects older than 50,000 years, however, because after that time length, the amount of carbon-14 remaining is too small to detect. Other radioisotopes have to be used for older dating. Now, just so you know, this is the equation that we use to do mathematical dating calculations. Ln of n sub t over n sub naught equals negative kt, where n sub naught is the amount of material that was present at time equals zero and n sub t is the amount of material present at time equals t. k, just so you know, is called the decay constant and can be calculated by using this equation, k equals 0.693 divided by t sub 1 half. Now I invite you, if you wish, to go to your text to find out how this equation was derived. I'm not going to show it to you here. That takes us to some cool problems that we'll use to finish up this video. First, the beta decay of cesium-137 has a half-life of 30 years. How many years must pass to reduce a 25 milligram sample of cesium-137 to 8.7 milligrams? I'm not going to do this for you here, but if you wish, you can click the link here to a separate video in which I'll show you how to do it on the board. And now, this one. The half-life of radium-223 is 11.4 days. How much of a 200 milligram sample remains after 600 hours? Now, I'm not going to do this one for you at all, but for students who are taking this class from me, if you wish, I'd be happy to show you how to do it in class. That takes us to the end of this video. Please stay tuned to the next one in which I'll continue teaching you about nuclear chemistry. Until next time, my wonderful students, have an enjoyable rest of your day.